chips, you can get your, your, uh, your tweezers right up under there, make sure you're plucking the right part. You can find a bad solder joint, you can inspect stuff that you worked on, and you can get down to some very, very tiny parts. I think that's an 0603 and a, I don't know if that's a, that's not a SOT 23, it's another, it's a five pin package. Um, it's an op amp or something, but you can really get in there easily and pluck stuff out. It's, it's like you're working with big Lego blocks instead of tiny, tiny subgrain of rice parts. Super awesome to have. One tip also, if you want to take a picture through one, anyone ever taken, tried taking a picture through a telescope or a microscope? They make you know, fancy adapter rings and stuff that'll do a great job. If you just set a point and shoot camera or even a dumb camera phone on infinity and stick it right up in there, you can usually get a good picture. And you can send that to somebody and share or whatever you're gonna do. Uh, I use that to twist some, the arm of a vendor and get some defective parts replaced. Okay, so how do we take stuff apart, right? How are we, how are we gonna go about this? So first thing, seems obvious, we wanna remove power. Uh, we got fasteners, generally stuff's held together, you know, and not just by, you know, we don't have the weak atomic force or uh, the sonic screwdriver to stick stuff together, so we've gotta put stuff in there. We got screws, oftentimes screws are hidden, like under do not remove warranty penalty of death, you know, so the first thing you do is remove that. Uh, under stickers, the rubber feet are notorious for hiding fasteners. Glue, uh, one of the things I despise about Apple products is they love gluing everything together. Fortunately, a heat gun from Home Depot or even a hair dryer sometimes, all you need to soften that glue, they're often like a tape strip or something like that. And then you can use the, you know, the guitar pick trick like we discussed, their case spreader kits. Uh, there are also these little pot scrapers that are used for cleaning cast iron and nonstick pans, those are great. Teflon like blade, like a squeegee. Uh, plastic tabs, this is the bane of anybody who's ever taken apart a laptop. You break half of those stupid tabs and then it never, you know, it's kind of wonky and never works right again. If you're careful and you can find them, uh, tear down guides are really good for that, locating those up, up front. Uh, a selection of high quality screwdrivers of different, you know, blade widths you can get in there. Uh, those long, flat plastic things are good for putting pressure over a wide area and not breaking one off. And if you do break one, you know, super glue, that's what that's for. RTV is good too, if you want to take it apart again. So, in doing this talk, I went around our shop and I'm thinking, you know, what do we have that has a wide variety of power and signal and junk in it? And then it, it occurred to me there's this boat anchor of a 50 inch television laying in the corner. So I thought I'd tear that down, something everyone's seen, probably seen plenty of dead TVs in your life. So I start off like, let's do a teardown. So, you know, get our screwdrivers out. That one's pretty straightforward. They actually have little arrows marking where all the screws are. Probably because plasma TVs break all the time. Uh, some of my favorite trips, you can get a uh, magnetic uh, parts bin. You can just drop stuff on there if you don't care about getting magnetized. It's not a fine instrument or something. Uh, egg cartons are really good. Uh, strip of tape where you can just tape little, little bitty stuff on there like tiny, tiny screws. Some of those, just the latent magnetism from your screwdrivers will pick those up. Uh, some things are so small, you know, the static will pick them up. So tape strip is great for that. I'm a big fan of taking photos along the way too, so you can find out where the long and the short screw went, and you can share it later perhaps. So this is this thing with the, the cover removed, and we can see we've got a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, we've got a lot of air, which is good, like if we were to try and add something to it later, we'd have a lot of space. Uh, but you see we have lots of big heat sinks. We've got like one, two, three, four, at least six boards in there. And you know we're gonna wanna figure out what those are before we do anything. So, after we take a case off, very common, we need to take connectors off. You know, the thing is just connected by a bunch of wires that are barely short enough to reach in. And uh, you'll see these all the time and stuff. Those things, especially ones in laptops, cameras, small mechanical items, they can have these very, very fragile razor thin connectors. And you might want to spend 10 minutes looking it up or gently prying or gently nudging, you know, to figure out where you, do you push the lock down? Do you pull it up? Because you usually only get one try with those. More robust stuff, not so bad. And you see here, we've got a couple different, so these are like 0.100 pitch connectors. These are pretty straightforward. The one on the left, it has a lock. You basically have to pry back with a pliers or screwdriver. The one on the right, you just pull it straight out. Uh, you can put a screwdriver in and, and just nudge that little plastic strip out of the way if you want, but they'll probably pull up without much, much drama. <clears throat> so here's the thing, anything that you are ever gonna get, you know, if you wanna start disassembling it and figure out how it works, it's going to have a power supply, right? 
you got to have electrons moving from a high to a low potential somehow for stuff to do anything. That power supply could be a battery, but there's almost always some kind of power conditioning, you know, play. That's where it all starts, where the power cord comes in. Uh, you're going to see power stuff, big wires, uh, thick traces on the circuit board. You know, a, a trace that carries multiple amps is going to be, you know, like five millimeters wide. It's not going to be uh, a razor thin seven mil trace for a signal. It would just vaporize if they try to put that much current through it. <clears throat> uh, one of the easiest things to do, also for troubleshooting, start where the battery or the mains connection comes in and start tracing that. You're going to see, you know, a circuit breaker, a switch, a fuse. You can test that stuff if you're trying to figure out why the thing's dead. Uh, you can also start looking at what goes in and what comes out to the other boards. Maybe you want to reuse that power supply for something. Uh, power supplies are also your most common source of dead equipment. You're going to see stuff because this thing is handling heat. You know, it's going to dissipate heat in its process of doing its job of converting voltage to other voltages or whatever. It's handling a lot of power. It's got a lot of high current going on and off very quickly, you know, very high uh, instantaneous changes. So that's just hard on stuff. Heat and changing high currents are going to, you know, beat some of those components up. Things like capacitors are usually the first to fail. Sometimes also uh, solder joints crack loose like on inductors, just the 60 hertz and pulsing and so forth can mechanically, you know, destabilize stuff. So this is a good place to look for stuff. So, all right, this is the power supply out of that television. So anyone notice something big, those big four blue things? What are those? Caps. Right, those are caps. And that would be one of your first things to look for if this thing was dead. Uh, if you see a bulge on the top, that's also danger. Uh, those things, you know, combined, those probably have enough energy to restart your heart. And that's exactly what's inside that AED that's on the wall of the hotel. Probably about you know, a dozen of these. Uh, you also see some transformers, those green things. Now those, if you were go not going to reuse that power supply, you could pull those out and measure you know, the, uh, the primary and the secondary. I mean, you, know, you could maybe step a voltage up or down to make a power supply for a Geiger counter. You do some cool things. Uh, these chokes, those could be useful. Uh, those blue objects, those are relays. And those are great, well at least the top one is. The bottom ones might be something else. Uh, those are great for doing things like, uh, you know, controlling big loads. Those are dumb and simple and easy to repurpose. A bunch of these other ICs in here might be house marked and might not be something you could readily reuse, but, you know, you've got a lot of stuff to work with. Now, it turns out in a LCD TV, you have 24 volt, 12, 5 volt rails, stuff you can pretty readily repurpose. Plasma TVs have a bunch of 60 and 200 volt rails. I don't know. I don't know about you, that's not so useful unless you're trying to do something, you know, I don't know, you're, you're trying to cook bugs or something. Uh, but this thing is also kind of bad for troubleshooting because you have lots of high voltage, high current stuff everywhere. Oh. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Huh. Dead battery? Yeah, maybe. How's that? Yay! Yay. All right. It's true, we can't fix anything. I, and I tried turning it off and on again. So anyway, AC comes in the bottom, lots of different DC power comes out these things. Uh, logic boards, right? Another thing we'll see, you'll typically see modules with loads of chips with lots of wires, thin traces. CPUs often have some kind of clock source, you know, little silver cans. Glue logic, so you'll see dumb seven series small logic chips that there's a line that's supposed to be low to be on and the other chip expects it to be high. They have little logic chips to, to change that stuff around. Uh, this is pretty typical. This is a, and I think this is a BGA chip on the right, you know, really ugly, nasty to rework chip. Uh, those are probably DRAM chips on the left and then there's some other flash ROMs and a little glue logic and passives around there. This is a good clue that this is definitely a logic board. And you notice how small those wires going in are on the top? Those are like 22 gauge, those are going to be signals, and even power on the right is not very beefy. So what, we, you know, what connects to a board? Uh, that gives us a lot of clues about what it's doing. So does this thing have an antenna port, serial, USB? You know, it's a good clue of what it might be doing. Uh, do we have any kind of markings? This is one of my favorites. Self-documentation. Uh, those dumb Chinese power supply boards that are in every LCD TV probably uh, usually have all of the input and output and expected voltages on all those connectors cleanly labeled makes it really nice to troubleshoot. 
If you look at this one, they have uh, some test points that were left there by the factory. And this one, it says something like data in, clock, uh, data out. Well, we could use those you know, if we knew a bit more about how that plasma driver works to see, is it, does it have its clock? Can I put a, a scope on it or a frequency counter? Maybe I bear, dive into it and I find out that you know, there's supposed to be an enable signal that comes in on data in and then gets daisy chained out, data out. Well, I could maybe measure both of those. Uh, I might be able to take this and do something else with it. Uh, these things are like gold, and you know, they save a lot of time. Also, you notice that it has its function. It says Y driver bottom. That's really nice to have. Also, the part number. Another really good one, anything that makes a radio signal is going to have an FCC ID. You can look those up. Uh, car alarm beepers, you want to find uh, the right transmitter for something? Look up its FCC ID. Uh, do a Google search. Do an eBay search. You'll find that by the FCC ID, even though it might be in a different colored case with a different logo on it. Any kind of stuff has you know, documentation that's got an FCC number. Really good. So components. A lot of you guys have identified and worked with components before. So large components, passives, you know, we're talking about caps, big resistors, usually through hole, stuff that's really high power, often isn't service mount. So what does that indicate? Power, right? It's handling, dissipating a lot of power. Uh, inductors, same things usually associated with high power circuits. Little passives. Uh, you're talking tiny little surface mount resistors and caps. You usually see it around signals. Diodes, you know, little SMT stuff. This board has kind of a, a selection of that. That's one of those driver boards. It's got some big high current uh, capacitors, and those are other filter capacitors behind it, I think. And you notice it's also got some little tiny signal logic. So it's got little voltages driving big voltages. That's kind of a theme. We have microcontrollers. We have digital stuff that just flips bits on and off, and then those are driving things that can turn those into analog signals or output specialty things like video or audio. Uh, and then we have power, you know, high power circuitry going on and off or supplying that stuff. You'll kind of see a, a blend of things. Uh, those are big through hole resistors in the lower right. And you've got also little tiny, uh, you know, chip resistors and caps in the middle. So you'll see a little of everything. Anything with RF, like television tuners, radio transmitters, kind of one of my favorites, uh, you'll see a metal shielding around it. Uh, not the same as the little metal bracket around your SD card holder. Uh, you're going to see other things like relays, those blue boxes. You're going to see that's going to be turning the whole thing on and off. If your fuel injection in your car is dead, you might want to see if the relay that's supposed to turn on the fuel pump is working. Uh, search protection fuses, things like that. You'll see that on the input usually coming in, you know, wires coming in from the outside, power, uh, input protection circuits. Digital circuits are very fragile and they're often going to have big power rated components that can do things like handle power surges when your car starts up or, uh, you know, surges from the power lines. Uh, then finally, you're going to have another kind of self-documentation. There's some standard labels you'll often see. Uh, R1, R2, stuff like that for resistors, C for caps. Uh, U for ICs, and you might be able to Google some of those. You might, you know, U1 problem with you know, Panasonic TV or whatever. Uh, you know, it'll give you a clue about what's working. And sometimes the test points will even say, uh, you know, 5 volts at U1, clock signal at U2 pin 3, stuff like that. Gives you some idea what's going on. One of my absolute favorite ways to find out what's going on with, with a circuit I want to hack, you know, let's identify a component that has it by its number. Uh, all data sheet, DigiKey, Mauser, distributors like that, Newark, they have millions and millions of parts, and they have data sheets online going back to like literally the early 70s. There are parts that are using the Apollo program in Voyager 1 you can still buy. And if you can't, chances are the data sheets are still there. Uh, a lot of times Japanese companies are kind of weird about this. They like are shamed that their old component isn't as good as the new one, and they hide them a little bit. But chances are someone has scanned it up out of a book and stuck it online. And maybe they might make you watch an ad or something, but you'll get it. And they give you lots of cool stuff. So these are like gold. These are your go-to source when you want to hack stuff. You know, so what can you do with that, right? Here's a typical one. Uh, this is uh, an MC34063. It's a really common voltage regulator. Every dumb $3 uh, iPhone charger that you buy at a 7-Eleven is going to have one of these. And lots and lots of expensive parts have them. Sells for about 15 cents in quantity. It's a switching power supply regulator. 
So this little diagram out of the data sheet, it tells you what every pin does. That's pretty handy. <clears throat> and it's got some other cool stuff. Reference designs. You look for those. Designers are pretty lazy, and they like to reuse something that somebody else already had a team of engineers spend thousands of dollars developing for them. So you'll find stuff like this. And if I know that chip design is something that looks like that, then I go over to my circuit board, I'll bet I'm going to find all those parts. In fact, I'm often going to find the exact model part that was used in that reference design because somebody didn't want to spend an extra day finding a cheaper or better substitute. And it's also going to tell me where I might be able to change stuff. In this case, the, um, the four resistors on that, I think specifically R1, R2 in the bottom, set the voltage that's going to come out of that thing. So if I want to turn 11.1 volt power supply for a Belkin 1995 USB hub into a 13.8 volt ham radio charger, I know where to start looking. And you are going to see the same kinds of circuits over and over, especially from the same manufacturer or different manufacturers making the same product because they steal from each other all the time. Uh, oh no, right? Every thing thought we ever had is intellectual property that's forever, you know, safeguarded. Well, it's not. Everyone steals from everybody. Uh, these are basic principles. Things like inputs, uh, power supply circuits, they're going to keep reusing stuff over and over that came from the manufacturer's recommendation, their own experience, their competitors. Uh, they're going to start using things like, you know, they're going to use op amps, they're going to use uh, protection diodes, and you'll see these little circuits over and over, and you'll get a clue as to what's happening going in or out or, or what's doing. So what can I do with all this stuff, right? Um, you know, what are you trying to do? Do you want to fix it? Do you want to add a feature that's not there, like a, you know, a button to hard turn off my television and not have it draw 10 watts for easy startup? Do you want to cannibalize it for parts? Do you want to take that big power supply out of there or that little RF clicker module and use it for my robot project? Awesome. More shrimp chips. You know what? I have something heavy that can reach. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. <clears throat> okay, so let's figure out a hacking strategy. So first of all, you know, in this thing, do the parts come up when I do a search? If everything in there, yeah, it's really disappointing to take apart some things like a DVD player. It's mostly air and like three giant specialty-made chips that say uh, Panasonic 6551. Like you're never going to find that anywhere. That's a specialty part was made. Oh God, I hit that. Was made for that manufacturer, and you're not going to find a data sheet. They hide that deliberately to make it more difficult to reverse engineer. Uh, also, that part was developed custom for one customer. They don't want it shared, you know, to other customers. Uh, it might have combined functions from a dozen chips you would normally see, and you know those are not going to be such good candidates for hacking. Uh, One-time programmable devices. Anyone ever gotten a uh, musical Christmas card? You ever take it apart? Yeah. And what do you find inside it? Possible. Right, a little dot of epoxy. So you know what's under that dot of epoxy? It's going to be a microcontroller from a, from a company called Holtec or one of the other three or four companies you've never heard of that make ultra low cost devices. Basically, if you're a manufacturer, you submit your program, they put it on the die. They actually burn that into the glass master that's made, used to make the chips. It's called MassGrom program. And they give you a tray of like 2,000 of those chips, and they're maybe a nickel a piece. And if the program's wrong, you just throw the whole tray and get another one. They are basically raw bare silicone that's stuck down, soldered to the board, and then a glob of epoxy's put on it. Not so much hacking potential, right? Uh, even parts that have their own cases might be made to be programmed once. The program's burned into it once, fuses are blown, it can never be reprogrammed. Those are things where you're going to have to adjust your strategy if you want to do anything with it. You might have to just cut the traces to that and solder on an Atmel or a PIC microcontroller that you do have the ability to program. Uh, high speed devices. So I don't know if any of you uh, are familiar with a guy named Bunny Wang. He did the uh, original Xbox hack. He was at the time a PhD student at MIT. He had to use an FPGA and build his own 200 megahertz, it was like a DDR bus sniffer. Okay, that's probably not going to happen for most of us, right? Anything that's high speed, you know, that thing is producing gigabytes of data per second. Uh, and, you know, you actually had to use, uh, overclock the FPGA and write special filter algorithms to just snarf the little bits of traffic you do need. Um, you know, higher speed it is, the signals degrade quickly, just the act of probing it makes the thing malfunction, and you're going to have a hard time. You might be better off 
thinking about something else. Anything with difficult access, that little chip that said Genesis on, that's a BGA. None of the pins are accessible where you could solder them or probe them. If you take it off, you can't use it. And almost certainly, all of those traces that carry signals are buried two, three, or five layers deep in that board. You know, you're going to have to look for test points or places that break out or, or make a guess when it connects to another chip if you want to actually get access to it. So, you know, what are some of the things you could do, you know, even with those limitations? Well, if this thing has a ROM, and by looking up those part numbers, you can find out, does it have some kind of programmable memory that stores a, a program or a very dumb program that tells us to look on the hard drive for the real program? Maybe I can pull it off or connect to it, and, and maybe I can dump those contents and change it a little. This is a pretty classic way to change uh, car performance, like OBD1 car computers. Uh, the mod chips, you know, more power and mileage, kind of mutually exclusive, but whatever. Those are typically dumping a ROM that doesn't even necessarily have a program. It may just have some value stored. You can change those magic numbers and observe that the car does something else. Um, dump that ROM, change it. You know, you can, you're going to have to locate it. You're going to have to find a device that can program it and find a way to attach to it. And newer, smarter devices often have security fuses. So that microcontroller or ROM, you might be able to write a new program to it. But if whoever put it on there had any sense, they probably made it difficult to extract it. And you're going to have to know assembly language and be familiar with debug tools fairly extensively in order to, to actually figure out what it's doing so you can change it. However, if you're not that smart like I am, you might be able to just write a new program and upload it. Uh, you can get, if it's a well-known tool chain, like it's an AVR or a PIC, or you know, a few of the, uh, like the STM from Asia, ST microcontrollers, they have lots of easy to get out tools, and you can get the development board, or you can work on your project, and actually you know, get the thing to blink the LED and the power light, and then work your way up from there. This is uh, typically a good strategy if you're trying to hack something really simple, like a coffee maker, or a dumb you know, turns on, turns off device for a more sophisticated device. 